This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today, alongside Bob Pastorella, we are going to be reconvening with Nicole Cushing for part two of our conversation. As always, if you missed part one, all you need to do is head back one episode to 309. And in that conversation, we talk about her new novella, The Half Freaks, her new novel, A Sick Grey Laugh, the mental benefits of running, and a lot, lot more. But as with all of these, you can listen in any order. So by all means, listen to part two now, and then when you're done, go back to part one. Now, before we jump into the conversation... Let's have a quick word from our sponsors. This fall, Experience Violet, the second novel of Stoker-nominated Kill Creek author Scott Thomas. Violet follows Chris Barlow, who after the death of her husband returns to a long-abandoned lake house. She soon finds the town of Paceyton, Kansas is not as it seems, and that a presence has been awaiting her return. Bird Box author Josh Malaman calls it a masterclass in immersion. Jason Heller of National Public Radio calls it indelible and says that the sheer skin-crawling fright is masterful. Available in bookstores nationwide and Amazon. Beneath Trinity Cemetery, something has escaped. Something not alive. Something not dead. Seven strangers are about to attend a private funeral where no one rests in peace. Night Creepers, you are what they eat. Night Creepers, the new novel by David Irons, available now from Severed Press. Okay, well, with that said, here it is. It is part two with Nicole Cushing on This Is Horror. So before you were talking about the idea that people are created by other people and there is no essential me or essential you. So I wondered how much do you believe in that idea? I mean, it's certainly an interesting one and something to ponder. I, well, let me first put some, a little preamble out here that, um, any idea in any philosophy that I espouse may be uh, uh, something I reverse myself on the very next day. So this morning, I believe that's likely to be significantly the case. Um, and part of that probably has to do with my training in psychology. I, I was a psychology major in, uh, in my uh, undergraduate uh, college. And it was uh, one of the things we learned about was uh, B.F. Skinner and operant conditioning. And, uh, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, we, we go after the food pellet, right? And when the food pellet is, uh, you know, that's, you know, basically the, the experiments are based on, you know, a rat is in a, in a cage and, you know, learns that if it, uh, you know, presses down on a little metal bar, um, enough times it's given a little reward. Uh, and I think there, you know, we live in a society where there are lots of little metal bars and there are lots of food pellets, right? I mean, one of these uh, places is called Facebook, where if I press down on the metal bar in a certain way as to post some piece of, of news or some kind of funny joke or whatever, I get the food pellet of likes. Um, and so that shapes my behavior. And even though I find Facebook distasteful, I end up going on to there and and uh, and doing things there. So it's it's difficult to say that um, we're not influenced. And certainly, you know, if I if 
if I'm, uh, you know, I, I try to be less this way as I get older, but there was certainly a period of, of my life where I was a, uh, a social chameleon that I would, you know, if I was around people who were very uptight, I would, you know, be very uptight. If I were around people who were very uh, chaotic, I would be chaotic. Um, and, and this was, I was very much influenced by that. So I think that there now more than ever, actually, there is a plague of conformity uh, and a lack of individuality um, that, uh, and the media doesn't help with this because we are given this homogenized sort of set of expectations that, you know, the, this big movie comes out from this big studio and it is in all the movie, you know, all the theaters. And so therefore the expectation is, of course, you're going to see it so you can talk about it to your friends. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think more, now more than ever, there are fewer uh, ways of thinking and feeling that the human spirit is being uh, sort of compressed as almost like as in a vice, um, or there there are fewer options. And it's, it's interesting. I was reading a book um, about, of all things, um, uh, baseball history. And uh, matter of fact, it's here in my 2B Red Pile because I've only read part of it. But um, it's called The Glory of Their Times. And what, you wouldn't expect to find any kind of, you know, kind of a thread in this conversation between baseball history and, and this conversation of the self that is made by other, other people. But um, there's a baseball player who talks about how when he was playing in the early part of the 20th century, that all the personalities of the players were very different and the people from the country were very, very different from the people in the city. And, and the, even the people in the country were kind of vastly different from each other. You know, when they all came together on the team, you had this real assemblage of very different personalities that melded together and that how he had noticed when the game, as the century had gone on, uh, there, you know, the personalities became more and more homogenized because of the influence of mass media. And, uh, and I, I thought about that and I thought, well, that's only escalated now where, you know, you are given only so many different uh, uh, styles of thought that you can adorn yourself with, that we, we are expected to go into a Walmart of thought and there are only so many different fashions on the rack and, um, and you can think this way or you can think that way. Um, but, you know, there are, you know, and, and so that's just kind of the, the way that uh, the world is working now. So I'm led to believe that it's probably true, but I, of course I can't live my life as if I think that's the case. Uh, and that's where the cognitive dissonance comes in, where I believe intellectually that yes, probably that's significantly the case, but at the same time, I need to have some sense of autonomy uh, and some sense of integrity and so it subjectively feels like I have those things, but I intellectually suspect that um, I am just a rat in a cage pressing the bars to get the food pellets, at least in some ways. It's almost paradoxical because we as humans, we seek out commonalities with our, with our peers, our families, our friends, our others. You know, and it's so uh, it's like I like people who are like me, and but I'm going to be different. I'm going to be me, and it, it's just it, it's like this. You're right. It's a net like a never ending cycle. Of this, yeah. And, uh, it, it's just yeah. it's so it's so strange, and it's like, uh, but it, but it's it, at the same time, you know, we 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 can't help but to want to be like others. So this is, this is, man, I love, and I love talking about this kind of stuff because I just, I love paradoxes and I love things that, that are, uh, basically like vicious cycles that we get ourselves caught up in and, yeah. uh, and it's almost instinctual the way it works, you know, it's just, yeah. it's, it's, it's very strange. And it's, it's very interesting to see how this plays out in horror fiction. Cause in my opinion, um, there are two very distinctive kinds of horror writers. You have the horror writers who take as their subject the individual and the world inside the individual. And the, so Edgar Allan Poe um, uh, mm -hmm. strikes me. And these writers tend to be more alienated individuals, people who, mm -hmm. for whom groups are 
a, a frightening thing. Uh, families are a frightening thing. Uh, families are a source of menace, you know, and you can definitely see that in, in Poe, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, the fall of the House of Usher and, and all kinds of things. Like, groups are, are just not a good mm -hmm. thing. And uh, these are folks who are really um, uh, driven by a need to express their alienation. Lovecraft is uh, kind of similar. Um, and I believe I'm probably, you know, more of an individual uh, more of a, in terms of like an alienated person writing about alienation. Uh, and then you have um, the, and, and Ligotti too. I would put Ligotti in that category um, as somebody who's alienated and needs to write about alienation. And then you have the writers who, uh, the horror writers, who take as their subject uh, groups and communities. Uh, and Stephen King is, you know, the, at the pinnacle of, of that. And Ray Bradbury is at the pinnacle of that. Well, these are people who do not feel alienated, uh, but who feel very at home with humanity um, and are really, you know, if you look at Stephen King's work, he's really not writing about individuals um, in terms of even the characters as much as, you know, he's writing about families, he's writing about communities. And that is his subject is communities. Uh, and families. And from the very beginning of his books, you'll see attachment. Um, whereas from the be very beginning of a Poe story or a Ligotti story um, or, you know, any number of other stories, you'll see um, uh, a lack of connection. You'll see a fear of connection. You'll see separation. Uh, and that is something I think is just mind good for all horror writers to be mindful of is kind of like, you know, I'm not saying either one is better or worse than the other. I think it's just kind of um, something that we're almost like hardwired with, or if not hardwired with, it's a result of life experience. And by the time we're 10, it's kind of already decided, um, you know, which side of the fence we fall on. But it, if you're, you know, an alienated writer trying your little heart out to be uh, a writer about groups and, um, and if, or if you're a, a, a group and family writer and you're trying your little heart out to be alienated, it's not going to work. You know, it's kind of like a, trying to fit the uh, square peg into a round hole. And so I think it's really mindful to know just what side of, of that particular uh, dividing line you fall on. And, um, you know, C Caitlin Kiernan is another one who is an alienated writer. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other more... Um, more recent writers. Um, you take a writer like Brian Keene, he's more of a group writer, more of a, you know, writing about the attachment and family relations, and families are good things, by and large, even if they are kind of dysfunctional. Um, and, yeah, so that's my idea, and I think, think it's helpful for writers to bear that in mind. Do you think that, that when those two schools of thought, those two ways of, of writing, uh, which there's like 90 million different ways that you can describe this in, in writing and horror in, in, in general. But it, looking at just these two, do you think that there's possibly a way that they could blend? Um, to me, it's like an, a great example would be, uh, you know, Who Goes There, which is the short story that uh, the novella that The Thing is based mm -hmm. on, where you have right. a group of people that it's attacked by a multicellular organism that can mimic them. So you have a group, you have a social setting, but you also have a, a, a loss of identity, mm -hmm. uh, you know? So, I mean, and it's almost like those two schools kind of, kind of maybe they don't blend, but they bang against each other pretty hard. Yeah, I, I have not read the short story by John W. Campbell. I, what I would be interested in seeing is if we looked at Campbell's body of work, his entire body of work, mm -hmm. is there any trend? Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of science fiction authors tend to – science fiction might be slightly different, even though that's a horror story too. Uh, mm -hmm. But you make a good point that there could be exceptions to this. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm ready to reverse myself at any moment uh, and, and point out things that fall between the gaps. But I would be interested in looking at, you know, lo looking at Campbell's body of work and seeing where he falls on that kind of, if you looked at everything he wrote, mm -hmm. um, would he fall on more on one side of the fence or the other? 
Yeah, it is. But I, I find it fascinating because I, I've never thought of it the way that you think that you're thinking of it. And now yeah. it's just like, uh, to me, it's like, God damn, this is so fucking obvious. I missed it, you know, <laughs> but it because it, it, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it's it's. And it's like, you know, it, immediately you kind of go, well, one of them's psychological and the other one's not. But are they really, you know? Uh, I don't think it's it's that simple. It's it's, But it is it is as simple as as attached versus detached. And, right. you know, it, and it's it's a beautiful way of, of looking at it. Yeah, and I think it's more like for, for writers or aspiring writers, it's something to keep in mind. Because, you know, for years I was, you know – thinking that I might be more of a group writer and, you know, kind of banging my head against that wall, you know, and say, you know, I, I'm, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm kind of a giraffe trying to fit into, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the door meant for uh, a chihuahua. <laughs> it's like, you know, mm-hmm. trying to make something work that just isn't going to work. And I, I think, um, with the kind of writing that is very honest with, Um, yourself, it's good to know, like, what are my limitations? I will never write a book like a a kind of uh, apocalyptic epic like The Stand, you know, because what what that requires is this, you know, kind of love of community. And because that's what that book is about, is about community and about how uh, survivors come together in warmth and uh, likability and affection and they build these communities. Uh, and there's another community of bad guys and whatnot. And uh, I'm just not psychologically equipped to write about that. I can write about alienation. I can write about madness. Gosh, I can write about madness. Um, You know, I can write about the madness of the world. I can write about my personal madness. Uh, But I, I'm, you know, part of it is I, I don't have as much interest now that I found out what I can do. But part of it is just kind of like I remember reading the beginning of it maybe about three or four years ago. And, you know, where the, from the very beginning you see this attachment between characters where you have a, a family and you have a brother who's sick and you have another brother who is caring about that brother. And it's like from the very first pages, it's about connection where, you know, it's like I don't gravitate towards that as much. I gravitate more towards, you know, uh, Edgar Allan Poe telling us that, uh, you know, in the very first lines, how dreadfully nervous he is and was, and, you know, but why will you say that I am mad? Uh, and uh, and so I learned, you know, it's like a, there was a twinge of disappointment at that point because it's like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not that kind of writer. That's not what I'm built to be. But, you know, I'm built to be this other thing. And, um, and I can appreciate that. I can have just as valid a career as anyone else. Um, you know, I don't feel a sense of loss. I don't feel less than, uh, and I don't feel um, like I ha- somehow can't live up to my potential or anything. It's just kind of being equipped in a different way, um, and and knowing that my side of the street is kind of different from a lot of other writers. Yeah, I think there's a lot to think about here, and I imagine that most people listening are now going to be trying to work out whether they are more someone who gravitates towards groups and communities or alienation. But I think it's an important thing for people to think about. And knowing who you are and what you're writing is not only important, but I mean, as you're saying, it's going to make you a better writer because you're going to know what you're good at and what you gravitate towards and what you're not so good at. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think every writer has, um, their list of obsessions and, and compulsions that they return to time and again. Uh, and sometimes in the early days, you don't realize it. Um, you, know, you usually have to have some body of work behind you that you can say, oh, yeah. Or sometimes a reviewer will point it out to you. Um, and it's like, oh, yeah, these things are all about this, this, and this. You know, like I, I didn't realize that I was writing a lot about conformity until um, Peter Tennant, who used to review books for Black Static, pointed out that, you know, a lot of my short stories express this fear of conformity. And, you know, he see, saw it over and over and over again. And it's like, yeah, you know, I, I, I never realized that, but I guess it's there. And kind of like, so the group is um, something I'm, af- I'm afraid of at some level. Um, and so, 
yeah, it, I mean, once I became aware of it, then I think there was a sense of relief because it's not like, oh, you know, that means I'm a failure. It just means there's this whole other tradition of literature that I'm connected to, this whole other legacy, uh, this whole other rich world of, of writers who have felt the same way that I do. Uh, and that's where I've discovered a lot of the literature from uh, Central Europe, uh, even some Middle Eastern literature that expresses, you know, things that I can connect with. Uh, and so I love who I am as a writer. I accept it and I cherish it. Um, you know, I only have one voice and that's my own. And, um, you know, the reason why I got into writing is so that, you know, my, my song wouldn't die inside of me. And so I, you know, I appreciate it. I love it. I love who I am as a writer. I don't have any kind of form of imposter syndrome or um, any kind of like yearning for anyone else's career. Uh, I'm very happy with who I am, but th that's come after many long years. You know, I've been doing this um, seriously for 11 years. So at a certain point, it, you learn who you are and you learn to accept who you are and you learn to make the most of what you got. Yeah. And when you found out that you had this fear of conformity, did you try pinpointing why and how it came about? Well, I mean, it, it didn't take a lot of, a, a lot of detective work really. Cause I knew, I mean, there were, I was, uh, when I was a kid, I avoided school like the plague. I mean, it was, uh, there were years when I would miss like 40 days of school and not just one year, but several. I mean, I, I, I had a lot of anxiety that was untreated at that point and a lot of depression that was untreated. And so in high school, when everyone else was worried about dating and grades and sports, I was, you know, I was going through each day, literally just, you know, trying to keep my head out of a noose. <laughs> you know, that, it was a successful day if I didn't attempt to kill myself uh, or if I didn't mutilate myself. And, um, and back then there wasn't the same kind of awareness of mental health as there is today. So, and I didn't really feel I can confide in anyone um, it was a very small community. And so the school guidance counselor was also someone who went to our church. And so it's like, I thought about confiding in her, but I really can't. And, uh, and so, um, you know, when you are afflicted with these kinds of experiences, then you, you kind of don't have that you're, you're not even on the same planet as other people. And that's the other thing I had this very uh, significant feeling at one point of my teenage years of uh, derealization and depersonalization, kind of the sense I was walking around the world in a dream uh, and that things weren't real. And, uh, you know, again, that's very alienating. And even, you know, more innocent things were more, uh, less severe things were alienating. I mean, you know, I had parents who were older than most parents. You know, my mom was 36 when I was born. My dad was 40. Uh, and so, and they were very traditional. So it was almost like they were more like grandparents than parents. That was alienating. Uh, and, uh, they were very conventionally religious and that was alienating. Uh, and, um, you know, I had life experiences that other kids didn't have. I had, a uh, a, you know, grandparents that were, you know, all my grandparents were dead by the time I was seven. Uh, you know, I was six years old when I touched my first corpse because I went to my grandfather's funeral and I patted his his hand as if to comfort him and I felt how damned cold he was. And I think, I've said this before, I think yeah. that's the day I actually became a horror writer um, because I had a dark story to tell right then. And, that, you know, what? who can you talk to about that? You can't talk to other six-year-olds or seven-year-olds about that. And so, um, yeah, there's, so I knew that... You know, I, I knew that these were the things that kind of made me, which also was good because these are the things that I tend to write about in one guise or another and under one persona or another in my fiction. Um, I tend to, you know, go back to these moments and, and uh, uh, re-experience them and uh, give voice to them in a way that I couldn't when I was younger. Um, because when I was younger, who are you going to talk about, you know, like, I don't remember talking to anybody about my grandfather's death. Um, and uh, I don't remember crying over my grandfather until actually I was writing a short story uh, some years ago, a short story that's not been published actually. 
um, because I'm I'm still not convinced it kind of lives up to, up to uh, my expectations for what it should do. But I was um, writing this short story, and I towards the end I just started bawling because it was about that kind of experience. And uh, and so yeah, I, I mean this is where for me knowing who I am as a writer comes hand in hand with knowing who I am as a person and kind of knowing like what works for me and what doesn't work for me. And, uh, and just being able to look that stuff in the eye, which is so powerful uh, and not shrinking away from it. And of course, speaking of shrink, I've had lots of shrinks <laughs> and, and I've had lots of help along the way to help me look at this stuff. It was not an overnight matter. I, I've had goodness knows how many years of therapy uh, and, uh, and a little bit of Zoloft along the way to help out. Uh, and so, but, you know, now at middle age, I can kind of look at this stuff in the eye and, uh, not feel intimidated by it and not be overwhelmed by it, but, you know, face it. And I find some dignity in that. I find some, uh, a sense of relief in that, um, in a sense of almost mastery over it, uh, at times. Um, so yeah, that's, I, I forget what our original question was, but I, and I've given this long answer, um, but that's my answer. Yeah. And I remember you telling us the first time you were on about touching your grandfather's hand and realizing just how cold it was. Cause mm -hmm. I know you said that you didn't realize that at a funeral, you weren't actually meant to touch the right. corpse and I mean, that in itself must have been a, a transformational experience to have had that happen at such a young age. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, and then conversations that I would hear about death in, in the aftermath and, you know, by adults. And, and uh, you know, I don't know whether this is an actual memory or not, um, but in my head, I have this memory of, like, some of my siblings talking about, like, well, what happens to the body when it decomposes? Like, this was, like, maybe six months after my grandfather died. <laughs> and we're talking, and I, if I recall correctly, and I'm not saying that I am, um, you know, because my sister might hear this, and she might say, this did not happen. Right. So, um, but my memory is that about six months afterwards, my siblings were around, and they were talking about, like, well, here's what happens to the body you know, when it decays after six months. So, you know, at least my memory is that that was a conversation. And so that's, you know, takes it to another level. And of course, you know, this experience kind of dovetailed with the emergence of horror entertainment and pop culture. This was uh, the late seventies. So you had the horror boom, um, you know, that started really with uh, the exorcist, I think, um, or maybe Rosemary's Baby, and uh, you know was continuing on in the '70s and swelled into the into the late '80s. Um, that was the time of my childhood. And while my parents' uh, religious convictions and also geographical distance kept me from the movie theater uh, and even from uh, video rental, uh, I was able to get some taste of horror pop culture through television. And, and so it was this perfect storm of I had these experiences and other experiences too, experiences with trauma, experiences with uh, just uh, family conflict, all of these kinds of things. And, um, and, and happening at the same time where there was a uh, kind of entertainment that was provided that dared to talk about death when no one in my family was really talking about like how to, how to suffer, how to struggle with grief. Um, and, uh, and there was, you know, you, you had this acknowledgement of the dark aspects of life, which, um, and the, the acceptance of, yeah, people die <laughs> and, and, and that pain exists and that, uh, death is ugly. There's nothing beautiful about death. Um, in, in my experience i mean it's like um you know i had a friend die of breast cancer and one you know one year she was a perfectly functioning individual and then she uh the, the disease turned her into this person who um lo lost a lot of her personhood from the brain tumors and because it metastasized from her breast to her brain and then um and then she was a box of ashes 
and uh, you had this person who was wonderfully complex, and then you have, you know, the chemical equivalent of dirt, you know, or carbon. Uh, and and so nobody in my childhood was talking about that other than shows like um, uh, the Night Gallery, and I would I would see uh, Rod Serling's Night Gallery gallery on in reruns um and i would see shows like tales from the dark side and tales from the crypt and friday the 13th the series and this kind of thing where uh people screamed and we can talk about scream queens and how you know the um how cheesy that is but for a kid who really needed to scream and wasn't allowed to to see and hear other people screaming it's like, yes, that's what life is about. <laughs> um, and I needed, I connected with that. And, um, and so, which, and the rest, as they say, is history. Right. Yeah. And were you the youngest of your siblings? And I was. Oh, yeah. My brother, five years older than me. And then I had about five years older than me. And I had a sister, 13 years older than me. And I had a brother, 15 years older than me. So, uh, especially with my older siblings, it was uh, this very strange kind of, separation of ages um and the consequence of that is that i was you know they when they they got into their late teens and 20s they were dealing with the kinds of things that kids in their late teens and 20s deal with and i was kind of along for the ride because i was um you know i was young and these things were affecting the family so uh i had to grow up a little bit quicker i think yeah so i guess the older of the sisters and the brother were maybe even more like a young uncle and auntie in terms of the relationship exactly. that they had to you. Exactly. And do you think that your siblings also gravitated towards the dark and towards horror and things of that nature? Um, my sister and I sometimes share that. Uh, when I go to visit her, you know, we can watch horror movies together. Um, my brother, not so much. My brother, my brother continued to be very conventional and very religious. Um, and in fact, he became even more conservatively religious and more uptight and, uh, and more convinced to see optimism than my parents were. <laughs> and so, um, and so, yeah, uh, there's one of these siblings that I talk to and there's one that I don't. And I, I challenge you to guess which one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you I know, mean, it, that that does answer the next question that I was wondering about asking, which is whether the the religious conservatism meant that there was a bit of a conflict or any, oh, yeah. any but, but yeah. I mean I, I had a feeling yeah. I knew the answer anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean it it's and that that's why I'm so probably one reason why I'm so terrified of people who, you know, if you have somebody who is convinced that they're right and feels the need to convince everyone else that they're right, in my experience, I mean, th that's just the bus that I was ran over by. Yeah. And so if I'm skittish about it, you know, like if I'm skittish about politics and people who are convinced that they're right and that everyone else needs to see it their way, um, it's because, you know, fanaticism of any ty type is, you know, I, it's like I had the tire tracks of <laughs> that, you know, in my, over my soul. And, um, and I, you know, I, I think just being a little gentle, um, you know, the, the people who, who I've known who have been very, uh, religiously dogmatic often lack gentleness or certainly they lack gentleness with themselves. Um, and you know, and as a result, they're kind of nervous wrecks and as a result, they need the religion more. And, you know, what uh, Bob was talking about with the vicious cycle, certainly, you know, it's like people are taught in early age that, um, that there's something inherently wrong with them, uh, whether you call it original sin or whatever. Um, and so there's something about you that's broken. And so this creates a lot of anxiety. So you have to turn it to the church to relieve your anxiety and tell you that you're okay. But the church reinforces the idea that there's something inherently bad about you. And that, so then you go back to the church to get more comfort. And it's like this uh, cycle of addiction, really, based on a very messed up idea that uh, you are flawed in, at inception. Uh, and so the, the church kind of, in my in, in Christianity more broadly, uh, is dedicated to planting the seed of inadequacy in you so that they can then grow the seed and harvest it. 
and you are mm-hmm. the crow. And um, and so I don't play that game. <laughs> you know, I'm at the point of the, of my life where uh, maybe there is something supernatural. I've had some experiences that were sort of interesting in that array, or maybe my brain was just malfunctioning. I don't know. Um, but regardless of what your experience is with that, just the the people who are convinced that you are you are wrong and that they have the answer, um, you know, those people scare me. And it, it scares me in politics. It scares me in religion. The people who are convinced that only they know what is the right way to, to proceed and that you don't and that you need to uh, – you need to come on to their side or else you um, you are just, uh, you know, you, you're, you deserve to be cast out. Um, those people scare me. Um, mm. So, yeah, that's probably where, why I'm, I'm, you know, not, not fond of, of politics and why I'm, I'm uh, not fond of, um, of groups <laughs> in general, because uh, once you get a group to get, now I, I do play team sports and that's kind of a different affair because inherently everyone is on the same page and they have a common goal and, um, and it's, it's only for an hour, right? You know, a typical softball game is lasting an hour and then everyone goes their separate ways. Um, and so that's a different kind of thing. And that's been a positive way of me connecting with the group. But, um, but that's because nobody is trying to, you know, proselytize anyone else and nobody is, in, you know, in, in a, a team sports, actually, you're trying to lift each other up and you're trying to say, you know, you don't criticize people on your team uh, in a healthy team. You know, you don't, uh, if somebody, uh, you know, messes up at the plate or in the field and softball, you don't go and, and harangue them about how much of a fuck up they are. You lift them up, you know, cause you know that you're going to be somebody who fucks up, you know, possibly, the next time and it's about you know team unity uh and there are a select other kinds of organizations that foster this kind of unity above all else but um and that that aren't dogmatic but yeah i'm, I'm just scared to death of uh people who are convinced they're right yeah oh yeah definitely you know, and it's 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 amazing because we we live in a society where if you have an opinion, suddenly it is the only opinion that matters. It's it's as though or we have given so much weight to opinions that facts go out of the window. Mm-hmm. And uh, as I get older, I'm reminded constantly, constantly of the Will, William Goldman quote about Hollywood. And you know, because I think he was asked, you know, years ago, how 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 did he navigate? You know, through through Hollywood, you know, writing screenplays and writing stories mm-hmm. and things like that. And one of the things he says is, "No one knows what the fuck they're doing." Yeah. And it, you can apply that to anything. Yep. Even politics. These mm-hmm. people do not know what the fuck they're doing. No one knows what the fuck they're doing. Mm-hmm. We yeah. only have an idea of what of how it should be done. We need to be open to interpretation, open to change, because that is the one thing that is a constant in our lives. It's change. Yeah, so, I think I think the main thing is like, um, you know, humility uh, is mm-hmm. important, and I and humility is different than humiliation. I mean, humi- like I mentioned earlier that I don't have imposter syndrome, but one of the things I do try to nurture is humility. So it's like, uh, while I don't feel you know, I don't have self doubt because that implies something kind of toxic about, you know, like I, something like there's something deficient about me. Um, I do have humility when I approach a project of, you know, I can do this if I, you know, am true to myself, if I work my butt off, if I, uh, you know, go through multiple drafts, if I show it to a beta reader, if I, um, you know, hold myself to the highest standard, and don't take anything for granted and focus with all my heart and mind and soul, then yes, I can do this. So yeah, I mean, when people have humility, then there's, you know, the sense of like, just knowing that I don't know everything um, and knowing that I'm going to fuck up and knowing that I might unintentionally hurt somebody's feelings um, and knowing that I'm not always as kind as I should be. Um, you know, and that's the only way we grow 
And if I'm convinced that I'm always right and that the people who uh, I disagree with are uh, terrible people, then then there's no room for for me to grow because I know all the answers already. Um, and, and, you know, so humility is important to me and also vulnerability, you know, just kind of um, letting myself, and that, that's the other thing is the people who are really strident and dogmatic about anything aren't, they don't let themselves be terrifically vulnerable. Um, you know, they kind of have their, their hard shell up. And, uh, and so they're, they're kind of more or less always uh, protected by knowing all the answers. Um, and that doesn't really leave room for introspection. Right. It seems like there's generally, uh, I find that there's a, a lack of self-respect, self-reflection, excuse me, but there also seems to be a lack of shame hmm. and, and shame is, uh, it's painful, but I think it's, it's important. It's, it's, it's something that, that I, I, I see, I see this in people. And I, I probably I probably feel it in myself, and you know we 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 do try to put up fronts. Uh, they're protective mechanisms. They they we deflect, we project. Uh, we want to to protect our psyches, uh-huh. uh, but you know the the ability to become self reflective. Uh, you know, unfortunately for most people, including myself, at most times is, is you know, is hindsight's twenty twenty. It's like I should have known better, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's just you know this is, it, it, and, and I love what you the the difference between you, humiliation and humility. Humility is you know branched from human, you know. So mm. it, it's they both are. It's just a, one of them is 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 a way of, of an approach to things that is self reflective. The other one is grappling with guilt. Uh, over something that uh that the way that others feel so it it's it's just you know it's just one of the many faucets of our lives that we have to try to navigate right yeah and, and nobody does it perfectly right i mean and there's right. no instru- and there's no instruction book for this no. uh and and so it, for me it's just constant trial and error and and having a i do have a group of friends that i can talk to and say, this is going on with me, and um, what do you think? Uh, and that really helps to have it. You know, I have a, a close group of confidants who are not writers, <laughs> uh, and I think that helps too, uh, who I can just kind of like have heart-to-hearts with. And having that level of, um, you know, emotional intimacy with friends uh, and all, I obviously also have emotional intimacy with my husband and everything, but having, you know, being able to having people that you can talk to about anything uh, and that you have no secrets from um, and not, I don't have a whole lot of those people, but I have my little posse, my little tribe. Uh, and, um, and it, it really does make a difference and um, not feel that, cause that way I'm not alone. Right. And that way I, you know, it's when I'm alone trying to figure everything out and without any reference to any peers, which of course is a group. And here I, I t- I've talked about my aversion to groups, but uh, I, again, I, I definitely uh, am uh, admittedly completely inconsistent with my thoughts and feelings because here I'm talking about the importance of a group as far as keeping me sane. But I do have a small group of people who I do trust who uh, are important to me. But when I write, that isn't that interesting to me. <laughs> when I write, I, I, I feel the need to talk about the pain um, because the comfort isn't very interesting. Um, and it's not something I need to get off my chest. And, um, and it's, it, you know, yeah. So that's kind of where I'm coming at it from. Right. And I mean, when Bob said that he thought shame was important, that's something that I would disagree with. I think shame itself isn't helpful i think shame and regret are two things that should be avoided where possible because it's negative it's destructive it's going to take its toll on your mental health Mm -hmm. but i do think that self-awareness and self-reflection and striving to do better are all tremendously good and are things that we should have but i think the problem is if you just feel 
shame and regret, you might not even act upon getting better and improving the things that you did badly. I mean, if I look back on my life, there are a number of things that I certainly wouldn't do that way if I could live it again. But I feel if I'm consumed by shame and regret, that's just adding another negative in into the world. And if I were mm -hmm. to not be consumed by that, then I could concentrate on the present and the future and actually adding something positive. I think you make a good point. I, and part mm -hmm. of it, I think, depends on how we define shame. Uh, mm -hmm. To yeah. me, to me, shame implies a little bit more of like this toxic uh, kind of uh, thing that I'm taking into myself and, and which is defining me. Uh, and that I don't find to be so helpful. But I think guilt is a different thing that, you know, to me, shame is a lot more kind of like damning the person and guilt is more damning the act. Right. Um, right. And, and, you know, shame is more is more all consuming. Uh, and guilt is more about, okay, I fucked up, you know, yeah. and I did, I did something wrong and I need to do what I can to, uh, address it and, uh, and admit it and don't, you know, uh, while at the same time, you know, not making myself a doormat and not beating up on myself and impeding the way forward. So, but I think what, what, um, Bob was talking about with, you know, the, you know, it, it's interesting because at the same time, we when we think of someone who is truly despicable, we we call them shameless, and so there is this um, mm -hmm. this sense of like somebody who just won't accept accountability. Right. Um, yeah, and I think when we say someone is shameless, we say someone who just cannot be, you know, is not is not even uh, who who lacks that essential human quality of being able to. Uh, see where they feel up. ashamed. Yes. Yeah. And that, that's yeah. exactly where I was going with that. No, we do yeah. not need to be consumed with shame or guilt. And I apologize if anyone would, would listening would even think that I meant that. What more on the lines of what you're talking about is that there, there are too many people out there that are shameless, mm -hmm. that, that have no fucking compassion. Right. And, and that, needs to end they feel that if they if they have that compassion or if they lack compassion and they feel that shame they push that down and they double down on it mm -hmm. and that's not conducive to a well-rounded society there's a lot of things that aren't conducive to a well-rounded society but that's probably one of the things that i personally notice more than anything else and it, it's it, dealing with people I deal with on, on, a, on a regular basis. It's one of the things that I turn around and say, you should feel ashamed for even thinking that. Yeah. You know, and they're like, well, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, and then you try to tell them about, well, you have a general lack of empathy, you know, and but th at that point you've lost them because. Right. No, it's just like, well, they're, yeah, they're not really, really doesn't they're, fucking matter. You'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I, I think some people will just enjoy saying cruel things because they know they'll get a, a reaction out of it. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and like, so they like saying outrageous, kind of completely callous, uh, cruel things because, you know, it's, and I think this is especially true in like, you know, uh, I, I have a, I live in kind of a blue collar world, you know, um, you know, my, my husband's job is blue collar and um, a lot of my neighbors are blue collar folks and a lot of the, you know, the people I play softball with are blue collar folks. And so I think in that setting, I don't know whether it's just like, a, a, you know, the release of a safety valve or whatever, where, you know, people just say outrageous things, but you're more likely, I think, to hear, or maybe there's just less... Um, you know, people are more open about it than they would be if it was in a more kind of like a, a, a subculture where everyone was supposed to be minding their P's and Q's. Um, and maybe it's just more blatant there. But, um, yeah, there, I mean, I, I've heard people say terrible things. Um, and, you know, I, I definitely hear from my, you know, from pe people I know who are involved in blue collar things, just the kinds of things that are said. <laughs> and, um and it's it can be dreadful. Um, you know, it's mm -hmm. not the it's not the easiest subculture for somebody who is kind and sensitive to function in. Um, 
So other than just kind of realizing that some people are attention whores and they'll, they'll say whatever they want to say to get that attention. Uh, and if it's saying something completely outrageous, then, you know, they'll do it. And, and so, and what we've seen is that that has then escalated up to where now, you know, you have, um, instead of it being just a blue collar phenomenon, you have it. And I don't want to, you know, kind of, obviously, like I say, I, I grew up in a blue collar family. My, my family right now is a blue collar family. My husband is a blue collar, collar worker. So I don't want to, you know, paint everyone with the same brush, but in that subculture, that working class subculture, these kind of norms of like, um, you know, saying, saying cruel things to get attention has now escalated to the point where it's the preferred communication style of our commander in chief, uh, who, uh, as we all have heard, you know, this is the guy who sounds like the comment section, uh, of, a of a blog post, right. The, right. like the obnoxious mm-hmm. kind of, you know, th- this is a guy who, um, you know, I think most parents would not enjoy this person being the coach of their kids' little league team, right? Because uh, he would be like com- complete, completely obnoxious and awful, and everything. And but because he seems to be channeling some kind of callousness that has become increasingly fashionable in the United States, uh, you know, this callousness and this cynicism. Uh, and this, um, you know, just kind of cruelty that has become, and lack of earnestness um, that has become, you know, completely fashionable in America over the last couple of decades. It wasn't like that when I was growing up, but it is now. Um, It's, uh, and everyone thinks that snark is sophistication, and it's not. And everyone thinks that rudeness is charisma, and it's not. Uh, and so we have these, uh, you know, this kind of uh, gaggle of people who are um, who are pseudo charismatic uh, and pseudo clever, you know, and they're convinced of their own cleverness and they're convinced of their own charisma when they they don't really know the, what what the real thing is, and and you know the the uh, awareness of the real thing, the re- re- awareness of what makes for real charisma, genuine charisma, and what makes for real. Uh, sophistication is vanishing um, and we're becoming much more dumb. We're becoming much more cruel. We're becoming much more uh, rigid. Um, And uh, there are definitely days and more days than not, I'm convinced that we are experiencing the dawning of a new dark age um, where nuance um, is something that people can no longer process um, because it can't fit into 162 characters. Um, and that uh, when that happens, then critical thought, critical thought is, is pretty much out the window, uh, too. People don't know how to think critically. Um, and that is an issue because, you know, a, a, a new story goes out there that is fake news and people don't pause and think, okay, let me look at the source of this. Let me look at the website that uh, that is linked here on uh, Facebook. And is this does this look like a legitimate news website that this headline is falling under? Um, And, you know, so everyone just kind of leaps to conclusions and you have this folklore that gets out there uh, that people are basing their opinions on. And we have people who believe the earth is flat now um, when in my childhood we didn't have that. And we have the erosion of literature, um, you know, where we, we have fewer and fewer real books and we have more and more book like objects that are kind of um, movie scripts uh, with, uh, you know, kind of refashioned in this way and more and more melodramas. And, uh, you know, when you think about the books that were bestsellers in the 19th century and how they were uh, much more nuanced than our bestsellers today, uh, you know, it's kind of like um, the uh, the equivalent of the burning of the Library of Alexandria, except instead of burning our books, we are burying them under a uh, mammoth uh, a mammoth colossal crap, and and so here we are, <laughs> yeah. and all we can do is do our best and you know kind of weather the storm in the same way that the monks in the Renaissance did by you know keeping keeping true. 
um, quality alive as best we can. And, um, and for my money, the small press is the place that does that. Um, that's where you're going to find actual ideas. That's where you're going to find uh, real creativity and nuance. And uh, and obviously, the small press is a big, big umbrella category. You can also find uh, stuff that is not as uh, meritorious. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's that, that's why I you know it's. In a culture where profit has become uh, the only value, then we get what we get. And so uh, I think we have to balance our financial responsibilities with an actual appreciation for what makes good fiction. This is what they did back in the you know, uh, 1940s. Uh, there's a great book that I recommend everyone read called The Business of Books. Uh, by a writer named, I believe, uh, Andre Schifrin. Um, yeah, Andre Schifrin. And he was a publisher in, uh, you know, who died probably about five or ten years ago. But he saw the transformation from when all the publishing houses were independently held and they were family businesses, essentially, uh, up to when the conglomerates took over. And what he saw was that... Um, you know, everyone bal in the originally, everyone knew that there were some books that were that you needed to publish some books that had a high profit to them. Um, you know, to balance it out because there were books that you know, on whole categories of fiction and poetry and art history or whatever that weren't going to make a lot of money, but they felt a obligation to do this because they felt a cultural responsibility. And uh, and back then, publishers were happy with a profit margin of about three or four percent. And then uh, when the conglomerates took over, what happened is that these small family-owned companies a lot of times didn't have uh, succession plans for when the um, for when the, the you know the original founders got old or or passed away, and so you had you know they, they sold to uh, corporations thinking that the corporations would have the same values, and of course the corporations said, well, now you're part of our conglomerate and. Uh, the newspaper division makes a 20% profit or the film division makes a 20% profit uh, and, or the music, you know, wh whatever. And so you're held to the same standard. Never mind that unlike newspapers, books don't have advertisements inside of them. Uh, never mind that, uh, you know, it's a different product than movies and, and kind of has a, a, a different kind of audience. This is your profit expectation. And so ever since that time, making profits for stockholders so that some rich guy can add another layer of gold to his toilet seat. That is what the culture has become. And it's not just publishing, it's in all endeavors. It's in healthcare, it's in education, um, it, you know, definitely in the United States. I think in uh, Europe, it may be different. And even in the, you know, in uh, the UK, it may be different. Mm -hmm. But uh, here in the United States, we are driven by profit and when you do that in the absence of any other human value, you um, you destroy culture. You burn the Library of Alexandria, or you 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 know cover it, you smother it under uh, book-like objects and uh, that are not true books, and you uh, bury it under a parade of melodramatic crap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. So it's permeated everything, you know. And as much as we hate it, I. I I'm, as weird as this is going to sound, because I work for a corporation and I can't stand some of the things that they do. I'm not even going to get into it because you sp spoke of it so eloquently. But to me, the corporation is the only thing that's keeping us from falling into a post-apocalyptic society because someone out there wants a profit and they need customers to do it. Right. And therefore, business is going to keep the world going as much as we hate it. Yeah, and, but it's kind of like uh, survival at what cost? You know, it's kind of um, mm -hmm. you know you can you can survive, but you can only survive as part of as being part of a, of a machine. Uh, mm -hmm. You can survive, but only at the expense of having your humanity stripped from you and having the complexity of what I mean. That's what we've had happen. I think mm -hmm. is the the complexity of what being human means is being you know, kind of eroded away from us and mm -hmm. we're, being whittled, we're, we're being whittled down 
uh, into, you know, this, so I'm this social uh, networking profile and I, here are, here is the style of thought that I subscribe to, um, mm-hmm. you know, much. And, and so I can, you know, just like, uh, I can run on certain software. I can run on just like a, you have a Mac or a PC, uh, right. You, you can have, you know, I have, uh, the left, the left, uh, operating system or the right operating system and, you know, the, the leftist operating system or the right wing operating system. And I can, I can choose from those two operating systems and I can install either of them. And the, and the operating systems don't talk to each other really. Um, but I, those are your two choices. And, um, I prefer to hack my own to the degree I can. Uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, and so, because I don't believe that, my thoughts should be driven by uh, a series of, of um, you know, dogma from whatever. Or, you know, you could, instead of political, you could say it's religious, where, you know, it's like I, either I have the atheist uh, operating system or the Christian operating system, to put it in the United States context, you know, where not, that doesn't represent all the different options, but, you know, let's just artificially mm-hmm. say for now, it's like, I don't want it to be, you know, driven by the atheist operating system any more than I'd want, because I don't want to have to say, well, I'm an atheist, so therefore I'm for, you know, at- all atheists believe in these political issues, and so therefore I'm on team atheist, and so therefore my thinking has to be ran by the atheist operating system. I would rather say, I'll take a little piece of this from the atheist operating system, I'm going to take a little piece of this from the religious operating system, uh, and I'm going to build my own operating system to the degree I can, uh, or I'm going to check out what the even better. It, let me erase all that. Forget I said all that. Let me go back to the world before there were operating systems, right? Let me go back to the. That's why I love so much of the fiction from before the dawn of the corporate conglomerates. Um, you know why I read a lot of 19th century fiction or early 20th century fiction uh, is you have a world where literary expression was more complex, uh, more nuanced, where uh, it was less dogmatic oftentimes. And not, that's not to say completely, because there was a period in the 1930s when American fiction uh, became dogmatic. And they, a lot of the same quarrels that we see now in, um, in, the, uh, in the publishing world uh, based on political issues or whatever, uh, they, were, we, they went through things every bit as fierce in the 1930s. Um, and so it's not to say that it was completely unprecedented, but I think what is, there was more tolerance, I think, for, uh, you know, different, I like to think at least in periods of time that there was more tolerance for nuance and more tolerance for, uh, looking at the complete picture and not, you know, saying, okay, here's a party line that I have to subscribe to, um, and that's what I like, I love looking at the fiction from those, that just kind of looks at life and looks at, that's why I love Andrea. When he looks at, at um, the seven who were hanged, it's really not about the ideologies of the assassins or about the ideology of the target of the assassination. It's about, you know, these people are human and they're all going to you know, die at one point or another. And the seven who are hanged are going to be dead more, uh, more quickly. And, you know, so they're imminently facing death and let's get at the humanity of it. And, and let's get at the issues of existence uh, that, you know, this question raises. And so that's why I'm so tethered to that point of view or that, or that, that literary tradition, um, because it seems much more human. And uh, I want to preserve as much of my humanity as I can. Yeah, you make a lot mm-hmm. of great points. And I think binary thinking and living politics, religion, etc. It's so flawed because thought and human beings just don't work that way we're complex we didn't evolve to just have two modes and i mean i suppose the good thing is i think there are a lot of people who are reacting against it they're not subscribing to the binary mode it's just probably that those people aren't quite as loud as the people who are dogmatic and deciding that they want to be on one side or the other when yeah yeah, I'm, I mean, you know, whatever side you gravitate towards more, if you're being honest, there are probably some policies or some ideas that actually work quite well 
on the other side. So, I mean, I would say I'm an atheist, but there are some aspects of spirituality and particularly around prayer and meditation that mm -hmm. I think can be hugely beneficial to human beings. Right. Actually, I've, I've heard recently the, the, uh, the word, uh, the neologism, uh, pratheist. So, right, uh, right. A, a praying, a, a praying atheist and, uh, you know, an atheist who prays in the morning just to kind of set a certain intention for the day. Uh, and, and I, I, that's where I fall into. I, I do prayer and meditation, but I, I, when I pray, I'm not praying to a, a God so much. I, I just pray. I call, I call this thing, uh, loving wisdom because it's not my default setting to be loving and it's not my default setting to be wise. Uh, and so, you know, um, I, I pray to loving wisdom, uh, and that works for me. And so, yeah. And, and, um, and so, but if I was a dogmatic atheist, uh, I wouldn't appreciate that. Or if I, you know, I can appreciate um, Mozart's Requiem, which is, of course, you know, all the Requiems are religious music. Um, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say, well, I refuse to have anything to do with Mozart's Requiem because it's religious music. Um, you know, that would be the same as these right wing people who say, I refuse to have anything to do with rock and roll because that's the devil's music. Right. right? Yeah. Um, you know, or I'm not going to like shun, you know, there, there were great works of art and architecture, um, created by flawed people in the middle ages, you know, but they, and, and who only had certain kinds of answers available to them or different, certain kinds of themes available to them, but they created beauty you know, out of, out of it. Look at the La Pieta, the, the sculpture, um, you know, of, uh, it's Mary holding Christ, um, you know, after the crucifixion. And it's one of the most beautiful sculptures around. Um, and so, you know, even though I don't believe in that, um, presentation of history and, and I would even go so, so far as to say it's mythological, um, I, there, there's a beauty in mythology, myth, mythological subjects, you know, going back to ancient Greece and, and Rome. Uh, and so, yeah, I just kind of, and while that, I'm sure Christians find that condescending, that's just kind of where I am right now. Um, and it's not meant to be condescending, but I think, um, so, yeah, I mean, why not be able to see something in, uh, and even like, I've had conflicts with people. For example, I've had terrible conflicts with my mother. Um you know, like not speaking to each other for multiple years kind of conflict. But if I, I can also at time and at time it's hard, you know, um, but if I can, I can see things sometimes and I can say, you know, here's a quality that she has that influenced me in a positive way. Um, and there's not a whole lot of it. And maybe there's only like <laughs> 2% of something that I can appreciate, um, you know, in the, in the whole of her personality, maybe 2% of things that I find, you know, admirable, but, um, you know, for example, my mom has taken great care of my dad. Um, after my dad had a stroke, my dad has, uh, been bed bound after having had a stroke. Um, gosh, I guess about six years ago. And, um, and she has been devoted to him and, you know, has provided the kind of care so that he doesn't have to go to a nursing home. And while my mom and I disagree on everything, and I find my mom to be a completely disagreeable person and, and a, uh, a, a callous person and a mean and a thoroughly unlikable person, um, she has that quality of devotion to my dad that I really appreciate. And I have to admit that. And I that means admitting some nuance. Uh, and I have to be comfortable with nuance in order to be grateful for that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of where I am with that. Yeah. Well, I know that we're coming up to the time that we have together, but I have to ask about the horror writing class that you're offering through Patreon. So tell us a little bit about that, how much it will cost patrons and what they get. Well, the model is something like Netflix for horror writing instruction uh, in that people pay a flat fee of $15 a month. 
And for that, they get access to the library of course offerings that I'm developing. So every month I'm posting a new video. Um, right now there are four videos because I've been doing this for about four months. Uh, and um, each video is about, each month is about 25 minute video segment where I teach a class about a, a topic. So the first three classes were really about the, I call it, I called the class Poe and the, and the building blocks of horror, where um, I used Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart uh, as a uh, example of a story that presents the three qualities that have to be in any horror story. Um, so those were the first three classes. And then uh, the second class started uh, at the end of July, where um, it, that one is called uh, Nightmares at 80,000 Words, Writing the Horror Novel. Um, and basically, uh, I it, it's going to be about writing horror novels. And I did the, the very first uh, episode of that or class of that in uh, July, and there'll be another one at the end of August. So you can, uh, if you join up for $15, you get access to all of the different classes. And the classes ha oftentimes have like PDF files attached where there are study materials, uh, handouts and that kind of thing uh, as well. Um, so you get that and you get a postcard for me every month because there's that's another feature is um, I have these postcards where I send out strange doodles um, it's just something I started doing several years ago, in fact, and I had stopped it for a while, but now it's available at the Patreon. So if you sign up for the $15 level, you get the classes and you can get that, the, the postcard sent to you once a month, which has like a weird drawing that I sign. Um, and, uh, and everyone is, is unique. Um, and yeah, each doodle is unique. I mean, uh, and you also get access to inside you know, unique inside access updates about like just where I am, what's going on with me. What, you know, I just posted one the other day about um, my preparations for my road trip out to um, uh, Providence, Rhode Island for Necronomicon. And so, uh, yeah, the idea is to give like, so, you know, just to kind of unpack it a little bit more and proceed more cautiously, uh, you know, you can join at the $1 level, and if you do that, you get all of the inside access updates. So if you just want to be a supporter and you want to know what's going on with me, stuff that I don't share on Facebook or Twitter, um, you know, then you can sign up and you can just get access for that for a dollar a month. Uh, you can join at the $5 level, and at the $5 level, you get the inside access updates and you get the postcard. Uh, so I say, said, uh, you know, postcard with the unique one-of-a-kind doodle on it, which I sign, uh, and uh, that gets sent to you once a month uh, at the $5 level. And then if you join at the $15 level, then you get the in, uh, inside access updates and the postcards, and you also get access to the Nightmare Institute classes. So that's what I call the classes, the, the Nightmare Institute. And so you get the, you know, the 25-minute uh, class each month and you have access to the past library of classes. So I'm really enjoying it because I've, I've taught classes before, but this is the first time I've been doing kind of uh, online teaching and I just love it. I, I really enjoy, I, I love the craft of writing. I love um, the horror field and this is a way to communicate all that and uh, I'm happy to do it. So uh, yeah, it's been fun. Yeah, it sounds like you're offering an awful lot and there's loads of things for people to check out. I'm wondering at yeah. the $15 level when people are doing the classes, is there much in the way of feedback and conversation? I mean, do you make yourself available if people want to leave some comments and ask something related to the video? Is that something oh, you're yeah. also doing? Yeah, that, that's um, that's one of the things that's available I, that I always mention is that the great thing about doing it on Patreon is, of course, I post the video and then I encourage questions uh, or comments. Um, and so far, most of what I've gotten is just, oh, that, that was a nice video, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but I do, I like the idea they're being give and take. I like the idea of, you know, and this is something I've recently started is I've, I've also started offering not so much through Patreon, but just as a, you know, I might eventually bring it into Patreon, but I've just been doing it separately, is manuscript crit critiques. Mm. And I love 
you know, basically a manuscript critique is great for that kind of inter, um, that kind of interaction because a manuscript critique is me and the writer, you know, popping open the hood of their car basically and saying, okay, how is this put together? Is this put together well? Is there anything that we need to fix? You know, to kind of, it's like the, the, uh, the writer is bringing me a, uh, an engine that they built and we're, you know, testing it to see if it runs. And I have suggestions about here's how I think it could run better. Um, you know, or it's like the writer is bringing me this recipe that they made and I taste it and I see if like, does it need a little bit more spice? Does it need a little bit more sauce? Does it need a little bit more this or that? Um, or a little bit less this, this or that. Uh, and it's that one-to-one -one interaction from the manuscript critiques that I really love because it's what I'm able to do. And, uh, is kind of accept the writer for where they are in their development and where what they want to accomplish and just kind of nudge them in directions for like here are some things to think about that maybe you didn't think about and offers concrete suggestions and, and everything but i'm not kind of trying to change them to write the way that i write right uh because that's not where their fulfillment will be as a writer their fulfillment as a writer will be in accepting who they are as a writer and so to do that i have to accept who they are as a writer um, and so I did my, uh, I did a, a, a manuscript cr critique this week and the writer uh, who I did it for is clearly more of a group writer than an individual writer or an alienist writer, you know, or alienated writer rather. And I encouraged him in this, you know, because it's like, that's kind of how he was built, you know, obviously. Uh, and I pointed it out to him and, and, you know, suggested it. And so, there's something really cool about even if you just play a little part in a writer's development, um, it, there's something really neat about it. And being, you know, having done this for about 11 years, you know, it's kind of cool to see like, oh yeah, there's a lot that I can help people with. Um, and it's just a real joy. All right. Sounds super cool. Yeah. yeah so it's, uh, I, sh I probably should go ahead and uh, talk about the link real quick. It's uh, patreon.com. Uh, slash Nicole Cushing, and Nicole Cushing is spelled N-I-C-O-L-E-C-U-S-H-I-N-G. Uh, there is no H in Nicole. For some reason, a lot of people want to put an H in Nicole Cushing, but uh, you know, or in the name Nicole, they want to spell it N-I-C-H-O-L-E, but there's no H. It's just N-I-C-O-L-E, C-U-S-H-I-N-G. All right, and mm -hmm. if for some reason they didn't catch that, there'll be a note. Uh, there'll be a link even in the show notes, so awesome. you have no excuse to not click it and check it out. Mm -hmm. Well, I know last time we were chatting with you, you mentioned that one of the ways that you really immersed yourself in story was you read a short story a night for over 500 nights. And right. I was thinking that should be a challenge for our listeners. We should get people to read. 500 stories in 500 nights so i'm mm -hmm. just putting that out there as a public challenge so if yeah you... and not even more than a challenge i mean that's really if i had to say the point where the pivot point for me as a writer it was that uh, because when it, that's where the period of time when i really grew the most i think because i began to see what worked and what didn't uh very clearly because you, you can't not do that after reading 500 stories in 500 nights yeah, I'm going to mention this to the patrons that we have on Discord on the Writers Forum and I'm going to encourage people to talk about it on Twitter and hashtag that as 500 stories, 500 nights. So, you know, we can see what are other people reading because not only is this going to be a great way for you to read more, but if you check out the hashtag, then hopefully if things go well, you're going to get a load of recommendations of other short stories from other readers. Yeah. Yeah. And what I found was interesting is, um, uh, it really forced me to read a lot of different kinds of things because, you know, I, I, it's like, I, I might like a certain kind of story, but I, a constant diet of that night after night, you know, mm. Like I, I'm not going to be able to, for one thing, I can't re just read all Thomas Ligotti because uh, Thomas Ligotti is, uh, there's only so many stories, right? And um, and also it's like I need some variety. So I, I would, that's one of the ways I really got interested in reading fiction and translation uh, and reading the more obscure people is, 
you know, I would I would be reading something, let's say, you know, I read a story by Richard Lehman one night, and then the next night it's like I, you know, I need something different, and I picked up this um, this used book uh, th that was an anthology of short stories, you know, from like the 1970s or something. And it's like, oh, I found this really cool short story that's completely different. Um, and it, that's what kind of made it doable and, and honestly bearable is, you know, mixing it up with different kinds of things, much as like you would want to mix up your, your food diet. You wouldn't want to eat hot dogs every night. Um, you know, and then you need to, you know, read different kinds of things to kind of cleanse the palate. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, where can our listeners connect with you? Well, there's um, Twitter is a good place. Twitter at Nicole Cushing. Facebook is a good place. Uh, YouTube too, actually. I'm, I have my YouTube channel with videos there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, if you're going to ask about like where I'll be um, in person, uh, in October, uh, from October the 11th to the 13th, I'll be a, a special guest at the Imaginarium Convention in Louisville, Kentucky. So um, that's a, a big writing convention, um, and I'll be on panels, and I may be providing a little class there. The details haven't quite been worked out, but um, it's a big convention. I just went by there to visit last year because uh, it's you know right across the Ohio River from me. And, uh, and it's like, I w went in the parking lot. It's like, holy cow, I didn't know they had these many people here. Um, so, yeah, it's a lot, lots of writers, um, you know, lot, lots of, uh, you know, kind of small press writers, uh, self-published writers, uh, traditionally published big five writers. You know, it, it, it's a, co a combination of folks and a lot, I think mostly genre writers. Uh, and so it's a, it's a cool little get together that um, I'm looking forward to appearing at. So you can connect with me there. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Final thoughts. So that sounds very kind of like, you know, famous last word. Yeah. Or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it, you know, so like if, if I die, let's say, for example, mm -hmm. if I happen to die before this airs, you know, and I need to think like, what would I leave people with? And I think what I would leave people with is be fucking honest. You know, above all, be honest with yourself. Be honest with the people around you. Um, be um, that, that doesn't mean that you can't have privacy, but um, you know, especially as an artist, your your role is to tell it as it is without any rose-colored glasses on, uh, and be honest. And I think you will succeed, or even if you don't succeed, you'll be able to live with yourself. That's great. And mm -hmm. I mean, that, that would make a great Facebook or Twitter cover photo or even a tattoo. Be fucking honest. I mean, the fuck right. might rub some people the wrong way, but you probably don't want to be friends with those people anyway. Right. And that, you know, that mm -hmm. if I, if I had to, you know, if I had to have something on my gravestone, much, much like, uh, if, if Lovecraft, you know, had, uh, I am Providence on his gravestone as he does, uh, up there in Providence, Rhode Island, then, you know, I, if I could get away with it, I would have be fucking honest, uh, on, on my gravestone. Um, you know, I'm not sure if they would even allow that, but I, I that, hope they do. I hope it happens. That's amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Here lies Nicole <laughs> Cushing. Be, be fucking honest. Thank you so much for joining us for the conversation with Nicole Cushing. Join us again next time when we'll be chatting with Scott Thomas. But if you'd like to get that ahead of the crowd, if you want to listen to every episode ahead of the crowd, then become our patron at www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Not only will you be able to listen to every episode, and in addition to that, remember you can submit questions to each and every interviewee. Uh, we have a range of great authors and creatives coming up, including Alan Baxter, Sarah Pinbra, Lawrence Block, Christopher Golden. The list goes on and on. And remember too, as laid down 
in this episode. Join us for the 500 Stories and 500 Nights Challenge. Let us know what you're reading. Hashtag 500 Stories 500 Nights on Twitter. And I'm looking forward to seeing how all of you get on. And looking forward to all of those short story recommendations. Okay, before I wrap up, a quick word from our sponsors. Beneath Trinity Cemetery, something has escaped. Something not alive. Something not dead. Seven strangers are about to attend a private funeral where no one rests in peace. Night Creepers. You are what they eat. Night Creepers. The new novel by David Irons. Available now from Severed Press. This fall experience Violet, the second novel of Stoker-nominated Kill Creek author Scott Thomas. Violet follows Chris Barlow, who after the death of her husband returns to a long-abandoned lake house. She soon finds the town of Paceyton, Kansas is not as it seems, and that a presence has been awaiting her return. Bird Box author Josh Malaman calls it a masterclass in immersion. Jason Heller of National Public Radio calls it indelible and says that the sheer skin-crawling fright is masterful. Available in bookstores nationwide and Amazon. Okay, as always, I would like to end with a quote. And today's quote is from Franz Kafka. Don't bend. Don't water it down. Don't try to make it logical. Don't edit your own soul according to the fashion. Rather, follow your most intense obsessions mercilessly. I'll see you in the next episode with Scott Thomas. But until then, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.